My name is Wanda Lewis, and I've been living with metastatic breast cancer since this March of 2014. Welcome to the session on insurance and disabilities. Before I introduce the speaker, just a reminder that you have <coughs> cards in your folder, so if you could use those cards, you'll be able to answer as many questions as possible immediately after the, pre after the presentation. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker, Kathy Brown. <laughs> Thank you for closing the door. <laughs> Kathy Roundtree is a licensed clinical social worker and case manager with more than 15 years of professional experience, including seven and a half years in oncology <laughs> social work. She was awarded the UNC Oncology Employee of the Month in July of 2013. She serves on the Patient Education and Advocacy Group for the National Marrow Donor Program and is a board member for the Bone Marrow Foundation. She has presented at multiple national conferences. Kathy enjoys helping patients and families as they cope with the challenges of illness and treatment and is currently assigned to the UNC Bone Marrow and Stem Cell Transplantation Program. Please join me in welcoming Kathy. Thank you all for inviting me to join you on this lovely Saturday afternoon and, yes. and for paying attention even though it's after lunch and after the break. I'm gonna, my purpose in doing this is to try to give you the basics of how insurance and disability work, identify some resources to help you deal with insurance and disability issues and some strategies for addressing those issues as they come up. I am aware that some or many of you are not from North Carolina. I have always practiced in North Carolina, so some of the comments I make will refer to programs specific to North Carolina with the, and I'll probably add, if you're from another state, you should ask if your state has this also. The agenda is gonna be, it says 20 minutes of lecture, but I can hardly say my name in 20 minutes, and so it'll be 30, and then 15 minutes q and I'll answer as much as I can. Um, I'm going to focus on medical coverage. There are many kinds of insurance, vision, dental, life, um, all kinds, an increasing number of insurances, but we're going to focus on medical coverage. So I started with a definition. Merriam-Webster, online dic a dictionary, insurance against loss through illness of the insured, especially insurance providing compensation for medical expenses. And essentially in the insurance world, there are two big classes of coverage. There's the commercial or private world with employer-based or other group plans or individual coverage. And then there are government-based programs, which are also called entitlement programs. The three big winners for that are Medicaid, Medicare, and VA or TRICARE. There are some important differences between these two types, so I'm going to say just a minute about that. The, in the commercial payer world, your plan is written by an insurance company if you're employer-based in collaboration with your employer. So your employer meets with the insurance company and, say, and the insurance company says, we can cover your employees for this much cost with a plan that covers these services and has these deductibles, premiums, co-pays, and so on. Individually, companies, insurance companies create plans that Every individual that qualifies gets this plan that has this kind of coverage. But those plans are all written by the com that individual insurance company, and those plans can be very different. So two people who work for two different employers can both have Aetna, say, Aetna Insurance Company, and have two really different plans. When you um, get into en entitlement programs, an entitlement just means that anybody that is found <laughs> proved to be in the group should have that coverage, Medicaid, Medicare, VA, or TRICARE, they, their plan is the same. Now, there are some variations of Medicaid by state because though Medicaid is established as a federal entitlement program, that means that all states have to have some kind of Medicaid program, the federal government gave it to the states to administer and said, you can have some flexibility in how you do this. So different states have a little bit different rules, um, but if you are in a state, 
any two people in the state of North Carolina who have Medicaid should be entitled to receive the same services, not no matter what county they live in. Um, how the county administers some of those services, like transportation, may vary a little bit, but any two will have it. Also, all of the entitlement programs are established by law, which sometimes people use the fancy word statute. So what's in them is defined by law. It doesn't vary, and there's not a lot of appeal for what's in it. So if they tell you Medicare doesn't pay for that, period, ever then they don't. And we'll come to more about that later. So how do you, you, that's what insurance is, and it's great because who could, raise your hand if you could afford your health care with no insurance. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> so we have unanimity in the room. <laughs> Nobody can afford to pay for their own health care. So we all get insurance to help us do this. How do you get insurance? Well, if you're an employee of a company that offers a group plan, that's a way a lot of people get their insurance. If they stop being an employee, they may continue their insurance through something called COBRA. Some or many of you may have heard of this. And I'll come to more about that. But that's tied back to your employee group plan status. So employee status or COBRA would be one way. Another way would be an individual plan, or an afford and those might be just plans that you bought we, I know self-employed people that insure themselves. They go to Blue Cross Blue Shield and they say, I need some health insurance. And they fill out forms and Blue Cross Blue Shield tells them it will cost you this much for this plan and sells them a plan. That model is replicated in the ACA, Affordable Care Act. Some people call that Obamacare. Um, and so different insurance companies provide plans, but how those plans are structured is defined by the law and is managed the federal government's in the background doing some management with that. So, but those are basically individual plans. It's not a group plan. You're not affiliated with an employer or a hospital or your church. No, it's, you're an individual, you get an individual plan. Medicaid. There are many Medicaid programs in every state, different kinds of people who should get Medicaid. So there's family Medicaid if you have minor children, and there's disability Medicaid, and there's, in some states, North Carolina's one of them, special breast cancer programs. Medicaid, all Medicaid, is predicated on two things. You will be low, in, low enough income, and it's pretty low. So. People are sometimes shocked if they're not aware that the criteria, the income criteria are usually very low. They do vary by state. Um, and you have to fit the medical criteria. Usually, um, the medical criteria for being covered for an illness is Social Security disability. But some of the states recognize that some conditions like breast cancer were so difficult to get through Social Security, and they were delaying things so much that they created special Medicaid programs. So in North Carolina, if you have breast cancer, it's a breast and cervical cancer program, if you have breast cancer and you meet the income criteria, you may be eligible to get Medicaid without having to go through, so wait for Social Security administration, or even if you're battling with Social Security over months. Um, and if you want to know about that in North Carolina, you go to your county department of social services and you say, I have breast cancer and I think I should get Medicaid. <laughs> and then they'll give you forms because nothing happens without forms. <laughs> Medicare is the other entitlement program and Medicare is more limited. Medicaid um, is only for people who meet income criteria. Medicare is not based on income. So not per se. You can have Medicare if you are in the category of people who qualify, but the qualifications are 65 or older, or blind, or um, kidney failure, like on dialysis, um, in which they call in-state renal disease, or you've been on Social Security disability for getting payments for two years. So you can't go straight on to Medicare, unfortunately. And then, of course, VA is based on, um, I didn't mention it, but it's based on uh, military service. There are a few important insurance terms. 
current continuous coverage. And I've mentioned these because when you're thinking about the situation you're in, you're gonna be asked about these things and you should be kind of keeping them in mind. There is this magical 60 day period. 60 days is the amount of time you have after you lose your employee coverage, you stop being an employee when you're in an employer plan to choose whether or not you want to pay for COBRA. And it's also the amount of time that you have to find something else and be considered continuously covered. This becomes important because insurance companies are allowed, even now, not to exclude pre-existing conditions, but sometimes to put some waiting periods on some things if you weren't continuously covered. If you were continuously covered, they are required to continue to cover you, and 60 days is how they determine that. That's, that's the gap you can have and still be good. So it's important to talk about current continuous coverage. I've been on insurance and I'm continuing on insurance. There is a little lapse in there. How little is little? 60 days for that. Um, I will mention, I will come down to COBRA and it's gonna go from 60 to 30. So keep in mind, 60 and 30 are important numbers. Covered services and medical necessity. All plans, entitlement plans and um, private insurance plans are all about the details. The people who write those plans are financial people who live to do details. I'd hate to see their kitchens. <laughs> so um, they make lists and words and words and words about what is covered and what is not. And it's really important to know what is covered service on your plan. So you get these fat plan books. Medicare sends you a fat book when you go on Medicare. Um, you get these fat books of plans and you go, my goodness, I'll never get through this. And you never will, but it's a reference. It's like a dictionary. You're not gonna read the dictionary, I hope. And, uh, and you're not gonna read your plan book cover to cover, but you're gonna use it anytime you're thinking about what you need. You need to know what your covered services are because you have some rights about those. And you wanna know about medical necessity because that is a really important term. If it's a non-covered service, if it's just not in your plan, it doesn't matter whether it's medically necessary or not. But if it's in your plan, there may be some criteria to get it covered, and one of those important ones from the get-go always will be, is it medically necessary? And that means that your doctor can say that this is not just about convenience or comfort, this is actually necess medically necessary to treat your condition. So if you hear those terms, medical necessity, you wanna help your, your physician document such things. You have some rights on employer-based plans through a law called ERISA. Sometimes it's helpful just to say law names. So, I won't tell you what ERISA stands for, but I will tell you that the, the main things that it tells you that you have a right to are plan disclosure. The insurer, insurance carrier has to tell you what your plan covers. And if you call with a question about it, they have to answer it. They have to process claims in a timely fashion. They have to pay your doctor if you unless they come up with a reason that they're not supposed to. They have to pay your doctor, in, and there are definitions of what timely means that are not as fast as most of us, or the working as an employee of the health of a health care provider. I can tell you not what we think it is either, but they have standard timelines that they have to do things. Certificate of coverage, any time you ask them to document that you have current continuous coverage, they have to do it. And you have a right to receive your benefits. And this one's important because if they deny you something, they have to tell you how you can appeal that and they have to have a timely processing of that appeal. So um, ERISA can be an important piece of legislation to know is out there and where you're gonna go to get help with issues that fall under that. And we'll get to that in just a minute. You have some rights under COBRA. If you're on a group plan, group employer plan, and you lose your employee status, and it is an employer of greater than 50 employees, so this is important, small employers are exempted, but greater than 50 employees, group plan, 
they have to offer you COBRA. Now, they don't contribute anymore. Most employers contribute a part of your insurance premium per month. When you're no longer an employee, they're not going to do that anymore. But they have to give you the option to stay on that plan and pay for it all yourself. And so that extends the coverage and extends the exact same plan. You stay with the same insurance company. You stay where you are in the insurance year. Premiums, deductibles, copays, the whole shebang. Remember, COBRAs typically cost more and sometimes a lot more because employers subsidize more than most people realize. Your employer contributes more than most people realize. So when they take that contribution away, whoa, you might go from 300 a month to 600 a month very easily. But it keeps you on the same plan with the same carrier. You've met your deductible. You've met your out-of-pocket maximum. Hmm, you're sitting pretty, but now you've got this large monthly bill. And it's kind of important to think about that when you're thinking about how you're going to do the finances, which is what this is all about. See. Um, and then you have some entitlement rights for Medicaid and Medicare that are written into the law that they, things that Medicare has to tell you. Um, I like the website better than the telephone for them. I actually think they don't do a terrible job of writing things on their website, and you can also order publications from them, and they're free. Um, they don't do a bad job of talking to people on the phone, but you gotta wait forever, a lot of times. Never call them on a Monday, and I mean it. Never call them on a Monday because they're getting all the reports of all the events, rele relevant events that happened on Saturday and Sunday <laughs> from everywhere. So never call them on a Monday. And it's typically not great to call them at the first of the month because there are a fairly large group of people who receive their payments automatically at the first of the month. So if they have a problem, that's when they're calling in. <laughs> so I always tell people, avoid those times. But they're obligated to answer your questions. And there's a Medicaid consumer helpline, hotline, depending on how your state calls it in every state that you should be able to call if you have questions about Medicaid. Whoa, I've talked and talked. Here are some resources for insurance information or help. State Department of Insurance um, licenses every insurance company that practices in the state and they'll go after them if they're not practicing in accordance with the law. So they have 800 numbers, look them up on, online for your state. State Department of Labor for employer-based plan questions, COBRA coverage, ERISA rights, things like that. If you're not sure where to go with your insurance issue, Patient Advocate Foundation is a great resource. Those guys are awesome. Yeah, and, and they will not only try to answer your, help you answer your question, but they will help you advocate um, with your insurance company. They won't do a, a lawsuit, but they will help provide the information for an appeal, for instance, and help you out with that. Cancer Legal Resource Center, they'll do the legwork for you. They're in, um, they are in California, so remember when you call them from the East Coast, California, time zone? I have found them to be very useful. Okay. I have, I have found them to be useful if I can wait and for them to call me back. But all, what they will do is tell you if you have a lawsuit, they will not carry it for you. So then, um, and I'm going to skip one of these down to the next page. Cancer and careers for employment-based things. If you're working and you're trying to figure out what your rights are in the workplace so you can keep your coverage because you kept your job, um, they're very helpful for that. Um, resources for expenses, I'm moving one from the page before. Cancer Financial Assistance Coalition has a search tool where you can either go by where you live or by your, your metastatic breast cancer diagnosis. So um, use their website, Cancer Care, and then some resources for expenses that are common for metastatic breast cancer survivors that usually aren't covered by insurance, transportation assistance, lymphedema supplies, hair prostheses, or other prostheses. So Cancer Care can help with some things, Patient Advocate Foundation, Patient Access Network Foundation, and then always ask at your oncologist's office, is there somebody here that helps people with financial assistance or when they have problems with their bills? because there are many local groups that will help uh, breast cancer patients and 
other, and then just generally cancer patients. And you don't want to miss out on them either, but they're local. So you're not going to find them on cancer FAC or cancer care or some of these other things. Now I got to fly on disability because I was real talkative on insurance. Two, just like there are two kinds of insurance, there are two kinds of disability, employer-based and social security. Employer-based policies vary. They can be short-term or long-term. They're usually based on your job, the job that you had before, when it, before the illness or injury. And the policy may be uh, provided to all employees free of charge. That happens for state of North Carolina employees. But in many employers offer it as a benefit that you can choose during open enrollment. But if you don't choose it, you ain't got it. You don't pay for it, you don't have it. So you need to know if you have short-term or long-term disability plan as an employee. Social Security Disability has two programs, so, uh, Social Security Disability Income. If you worked for a while and you've been working and paying into the system, this is what you get back. Big trick. They determine what they think is your disability date, the date at which you became unable to work. After that date, there's a six-month waiting period. And after that date, it could be another month before you get your first check. Within a month, yeah. But they have up to a month to get it to you. Yeah. So. Um, six month waiting period and then they start paying you based on what you paid in doesn't matter how much money you make or have they're going to pay you based on what you paid in social security supplemental income ssi you didn't work you haven't worked in years and you have almost nothing ssi has a financial qualification to it so you have to be their definition of poor and that is really poor um, because it's good for all of the 50 states um, and it will automatically give you Medicaid, by the way. Um, but Social Security disability will only apply if they considered you to have a permanent disability. What is a permanent disability? Basically means unable to do any full-time work, not what you've been doing, not what will support your family, any full-time work. And the definition here on the bottom is the definition from the Social Security Administration. The inability to engage in any substantial gainful activity, make money, by reason of any medical de medically determinable physical or mental impairments, illness or injury, which can be expected to result in death or which has lasted or can be expected to last for a continuous period of not less than 12 months, at least 12 months. So. Um, what do you want to do if you're trying to get qualified for one of these programs? You want to know what it takes to be eligible because you're trying to show the people who are making the check boxes, and this is what the people who do this work live to do, check the boxes. So you got to help them check the boxes. How do you do that? You find out what are the criteria. If it's employer-based, you got a plan, you call HR, you get the book, you find out how, how do you find out what the criteria are. For Social Security, you go online and you Google Social Security Blue Book. The Blue Book is Social Security's handbook for how you determine whether somebody's disabled for any diagnosis in any condition. Because you're going to take that information to your oncologist. Your oncologist was trained as a wonderful, caring person who is looking at your illness and wants to provide you the best treatment for the best possible outcome, but they didn't spend several years in uh, medical school and subsequent training saying, now write the note like this so that they get their disability. So they don't know, and you don't want them to spend their time on that. But if you take them the language from the Blue Book or your employer plan, they can look at it and tell whether they can agree and write that. And if they can write that, it helps you a lot. Help the information get to the right place. Where, does an, where is your employer-based plan managed? What company does that for your employer? How do you get the information to them? For Social Security, the process is that a Social Security information person is going to take your information by phone or in person, and then they're going to send it to a disability determination specialist. And you want to know how to send medical records to that person. And they should be able to tell you, this is the fax number, this is the phone number, Does it, do I have a claim number or a case number that I should put on that? And you get that information together and send it. Some Social Security Disability has a special list called the Compassionate Allowance List. It's a list of, of um, rings the bell diagnoses. They don't need to know anything else except documentation of that diagnosis. That's called Compassionate Allowance. 
You can find it in the blue book. You can Google online, Social Security Disability Compassionate Allowance. It's a lot of characters, but it'll get there. And you look and see if your diagnosis is on there. And for that reason, it's important to know your diagnosis. Can you just tell us if breast Not as such. It's the kind. Mm -hmm. It's what? The kind and the stage. And it depends on how the doctor words it. You so, can word it in a way that it won't go through. And you can also bring the one, relevant ones to him and say, can you put one, is one of these true for me? Pick one of these. Well, or you can say, is one of these true for me? Can you please document it this way? And, and say, I think, and you can tell the person at Social Security, I think I may qualify for a compassionate allowance and I want you to expedite the processing. Because that puts a different, if, it's, if you, your diagnosis is on that list, it does put a different clock on things. Because they have little clocks. They're supposed to get things done in certain times. Resources to help you out. Um, I know that some people have not had as good an experience with Cancer Legal Resource Center. I don't know if that was around uh, an employer-based issue or other, but they certainly, I've had more luck with them. Um, and the State Department of Labor for employer-based disability plans. For Social Security disability, um, there are disability advocacy groups in most states who exist to help people advocate for them, disabled people advocate for themselves. Um, in North Carolina, if you Google disability rights and see, you'll find them. You can let them know you're having a problem with your disability and ask them if they can help you. If you, you may wonder if you need an attorney. Lots of people, you see people at, at attorneys advertise on TV. I will help you with your disability. This is my experience. Uh, first of all, it's important to get an attorney that knows anything about disability, really. Um, there's a professional organization of attorneys. I've got it up here, National Organization of Social Security Claimants Representatives. What a mouthful. NOSCAR. You can Google them and they have an 800 number and you call them and say, I live in such place. Can you tell me who the, the attorneys who specialize in helping with Social Security in my area are? And they can tell you. And they'll make a referral for you and you can follow up with that person. They'll listen to you and tell you for free and tell you if you have a case for a short period of time. I think usually about 20 or 30 minutes. And then they'll work with you. How does that work? You don't pay them up front, but they get a take of what you collect. They will be most helpful if you've already been denied and you're appealing. Because if you can push this through yourself, you don't want to pay somebody a, po a portion of your proceeds. You'd rather have all the money yourself. It's only if you're getting into trouble. And I, I find the attorneys most helpful in cases where people have kind of a complicated situation. Even your doctor isn't able to write it exactly by the numbers. Um, if you're of low income in North Carolina, there's a group called Legal Aid. It's legal assistance for low income folks. I would imagine that your can larger cancer centers have their own programs for this sometimes, and um, many states probably have a similar organization. They may call it something else, So, and I would ask about it. I have raced through lots of things. I've probably skipped some of what I thought I would say. I'm sure I didn't answer many questions that will come up, but before I finish, I want to have a moment of acknowledgement and gratitude. I want to thank particularly my colleague Phyllis Williams, who works with me at UNC Hospitals. Um, fantastic, caring, and uh, superb professional. And many other colleagues at UNC Hospitals and our Patient and Family Resource Center and other areas that help us provide the best services we can to our patients and families. And I most of all want to thank, the, acknowledge the patients and families that I've had the privilege to work with who've shared their journeys and their spirits with me. So thank you, and let's do some questions. Okay. okay. Um, I'm going to give my best shot. I'm going to say the question, and then if I didn't under if I start to answer and it's clear I didn't get the question, yeah, just bring the question on up. Um, if it's clear I didn't get what you're asking, we'll we'll try again. So. Medicare A, B, D, and F. It, uh, it's, none of it's free. Dang it. Um, are almost the same price as COBRA with com when combined with A and B. Copays for Part D are not possible. Are there other options? Um, yes and no. So um, 
there's traditional Medicare and what's called a Medicare Advantage plan. So the federal government allows private insurance companies to take your, if you sign it over to them, they'll take your Medicare benefit and they'll write one of their own plans that has all the pieces that Medicare is supposed to cover, all the covered services, but they'll tweak around how they administer them. So for, I'll give you a for instance, maybe you need a nursing facility rehab stay because you broke your hip. Um, traditional Medicare just gives you a set number of days that you have with no copay and then a days more with some copay, but there's not this, it doesn't get reviewed by insurance and it's never less than this many days at the full copay. So it's not really tightly managed and limited. If you get a Medicare Advantage plan, your Medicare Advantage provider, Blue Cross Blue Shield, um, Blue Advantage, might say, you're not going to pay as much in a monthly premium, but we're not we're gonna review your need to stay at the nursing rehab and we might not think you need to stay for 20 days. So, you know, we're gonna manage that benefit. So you can go, you can look up Medicare Advantage plans in your area when enrollment period comes and consider whether you wanna do one of those. I think it's important to know what your care needs are gonna be and um, look at them. Assistance with co-pays on Part D, it's very limited, but there is a little out there, especially for chemotherapies. And if you don't go to a large cancer center, because most of them have pharmacy people who will, or cancer center people who might be able to help you with that, I would go to Patient Advocate Foundation and ask them if they can identify any copay assistance programs for you. If your income is low enough and you're not quite poor enough to get Medicaid, but you're really scraping, you can see if you, you can call, in North Carolina, it's the Senior Health Insurance Information Program, SHIP, um, and see if you qualify for Medicare Extra Help, or you can just call Social Security. Call, call them, everybody does. And ask them, do I qualify for Medicare Extra Help? That program will reduce your monthly premium for Part D and give you uh, much lower co-pays because it's partly subsidized by the feds. Um, with disability coverage, do you need extra coverage to get more of your scans and drugs coverage? covered? If you're talking about um, Medicare, um, do you want a supplemental policy? Probably, if you, can, if you can get it. If you're already diagnosed, that may be difficult to do. Um, if you're on a commercial insurance, like you, you're on a long-term disability with, for, you used to work for Cisco Networks and you've got I forget who they have, but we'll say United Healthcare. Um, and you have United Healthcare coverage as a former employee of them. You can't buy extra coverage. You've got what you've got. With state disability, do spouses or children get benefits? Are they eligible? Um, so there's no such thing as state disability pay money. There's Medicaid. The states administer Medicaid, but they don't give you money. Social Security is the only one, and you're possibly an employer-based plan, are the only ones that give you money. Social Security, if you're, um, your ch minor children can draw off your benefit, yes. Your spouse can draw if the household income is low enough, and you should call Social Security to ask them if you qualify. Let's see what I got. I got my disability on a compassionate allowance, but after a review, they said my condition has improved and told me to go back to work. My cancer is stable, but I have a ton of side effects that are not covered under disability. A lawyer won't help me because he can't get paid. Suggestions. Um, I don't know if you contacted NOSCAR um, to get a disability lawyer because disability lawyers don't ask you to pay them up front. Um, and that's what he'd be doing. He'd be, the, and I'll say he, because I'm of the generation to not say she. Um, but uh, it'll come to my mind eventually. But um, I, the lawyer, a disability lawyer should not charge you up front. They should be advocating for you to effectively backdate your disability to when you were covered before, because yeah, you got better, but you never got that much better. So um, that, I would call National Organization of Social Security Claimants Representatives, ask for a disability att attorney very, um, with a lot of expertise in social security disability in your area and try contacting them. If you've, 
I'm assuming you don't already have one. If you have an attorney already, you have to end the relationship with them before you can begin one with someone else. That's an ethical thing for them. That's so they don't steal from each other. So one of the few things they won't do. Um, <laughs> social workers get to make lots of jokes about lawyers. Um, is income criteria for Medicaid based on household or individual? It depends on whether you're legally married. That's the shortest answer to that question. Um, but it's supposed to be household. Um, but they don't necessarily count non-spouses and adult, like parents, living with you. Um, spouses, they do count they have to legally because your spouse has, you and your spouse have rights to each other's income under the law, so they have to count it. If you have an employer-based long-term disability that is for two years, would you then be eligible to apply for Social Security disability after that ends? I feel that I would need to die within those two years in order to not be to burden, to not be a burden to others. Um, I would be surprised if your long-term disability carrier didn't make you apply. Well, they don't say it make. They're so nice. They say, we're going to help you apply for Social Security disability. And they will, and they're good at it. And why is this? Because um, they write their plans and finance their company on the idea that if you're on a long-term disability plan, you should be disabled according not just to us, but to most people are going to also meet Social Security's definition. And so we promised them that they'd get a total income of $1,300 a month. But if they start drawing SSDI of 1000 a month, we only have to pay 300 And then they're up to their level. And that's what they do. So I would not be surprised if they would encourage you to apply. But there's, no, there's nothing that stops you from applying on your own at any time that you are disabled for Social Security disability. I see a hand, and I'm, I'm yes. is it related? Are you the author of this question? No, it's then, related then, to that question. Um, let me come back to it, because I have one more up here that has parts one, two, and three. Yes, turn in your card. I'm going to get to it. The oncologist says a patient who has stage four metastatic breast cancer can still work. Does this automatically disqualify the patient from disability Social Security? Social Security is not looking about what the physician, it, it is best if the physician does not document he thinks you can work. Um, so I hope he didn't. Um, that would be hard. If he documented that and those records went to them, yes, that would be very difficult. If he's just documenting your medical care, um, I wouldn't argue with him, but I might take the Blue Book criteria to him and just ask him which of those things he agrees with. Because it really doesn't, it really isn't his to say. It's Social Security says, and that's both good and bad. But you can take that and say. Um, you can always apply, and they'll make their own decision, believe me. Um, if he, however, what I said at the beginning, if he documented he thinks you can work, it's going to be really hard to fight that. You might need a second opinion. If you really disagree, if you really disagree, you might need a second opinion. Does sometimes it make sense to choose a private plan instead of continuing COBRA? Yes, um, in one circumstance that I know of. If your COBRA is more than 9.5% of your monthly income, you may qualify for a federal uh, subsidy, and you don't have to wait for the healthcare.gov open enrollment period and start in January. You can go ahead and start now in a lot of states. So you could call healthcare.gov or go online and run the little tool and see what it would cost you to sign up for an ACA plan or, because if you qualify for the subsidy, they can go ahead and enroll you and start you now, and you might come out a bunch cheaper. Is that 9% greater than your... 9.5% of your monthly income. I didn't get it more broken down than that. 9.5%. And you, you would need to show that your COBRA is more than that, but I don't know anybody on a COBRA that is not higher than 9.5% of their income. So... Um, how long does it take for Social Security to determine if I'm eligible? They have four months, the first pass. If you're not on compassion allowance with expedited processing, they have four months. If they didn't, and it's four months from the time that they think they had everything they were supposed to have. So it's not four months from the time you started. It's four months from when the case was complete. And then there's a six-month wait after that? No. 
the, so the four months is to process the case. They'll process it, spend a lot of time, and then they'll decide. So suppose you applied in October, and they process and process, and in January they say, they'll send you a letter and they'll say, good news, you qualify. Your disability date is, and then if they say that your disability date was November, October, they say it was October. They don't backdate it any before, but they say it was October 15th, then November, December, January, February, March, April, you'll become eligible to start drawing SSDI. If you're very low income before that, then you might be able to get SSI for a time. But SSDI starting in mid-April, you'll probably get the payment a little later, like May, for the first time. Um, and then every month after that, and they'll review you at a year. Um, if they don't have all of the information that they think they need, um, it will take longer, and if you have to appeal, it will take longer. Appeals can drag out for years. That's when it becomes helpful to have an attorney, by my experience. All right, can I get some Social Security disability benefits if I have retired with disability from my job? If you're not drawing Social Security retirement yet, yes. Social Security disability, yes, if you have worked in the last five years full time. If you retired eight years ago and you weren't paying into the Social Security system, no. Because you have to have been working within a recent enough time frame and that's basically about five years. Um, but Social Security doesn't care how you're getting your money if you've been working recently. Um, they don't care if you're independently wealthy. Um, they're paying based on what you paid into the system. Once you start drawing Social Security retirement, though, it's my understanding you're 65 and you're drawing retirement or the qualifying age, because by the time I get there, it's going to be a little higher for me. But um, you're the qualifying age, you started drawing Social Security retirement, you're on retirement. But if your retirement's your job and it wasn't that long ago, there's no reason you can't apply for disability. Yes? Does disability turn into retirement? Does so does security disability security switch security? over to retirement? Does Social Security did retirement, yeah. yeah, does it? I don't know. I mean, at some point, are they going to say, okay, well. You're, you're 65. Not, you're We've had you on disability yeah. for X years, and you're 65, so now it's retirement. And, and I'm sorry to tell you, I, do, I simply don't know that one. No. Same amount of money to call something else. Yeah, because I was 62 when I retired, but then when I got sick, I went on disability, and they raised it. And then recently, I'm on regular Social Security. They put you on retirement. Yes. Pay no attention to the paper on the floor. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I, if I make it to 60, I'm going to be 10 years survivor, so I'm going to say, hey, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you don't call me retired, so it's the same. But I'll never own a yacht. Oh, I'll um, never go to the Bahamas for two weeks. Any other, <laughs> any other questions? We got, we got time. Do they give you a percentage of what you make? So, so you're asking me, how does Social Security figure out what they're going to pay you? Um, it is a calculation based on what you've paid into the system over the years, um, and they can tell you what it's going to be. They mail everybody a statement every year. You might remember we started getting those in the mail some years ago, and they'll tell you, and you can contact them. It is not a straight percentage because it, it's cumulative over the years. It's not solely based on your current income, um, but they'll, they do it based on what you've paid in. SSI is the one if you have no assets or you haven't worked and no income you're really 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 scraping um that one is has a max i believe the max is 723 dollars a month and it'll be less if they think you have some kind of tiny asset that they don't count um, so they might give you a little less um, and some people get in a strange situation where they start out because they quit working because of illness they didn't COBRA because they didn't have any money. They, they're, they've got, they've not, didn't have much to start with, but they paid into the system for a long time before that. So for a period of the first six months, they're getting the SSI minimum payment, and then they jump up to SSDI after the waiting period. And that just gets a little funky with Medicaid because they start out on Medicaid and then they kind of lose it. But another question. Question of what happens if you have metastatic disease and you've been 
you've been on SSDI, compassionate allowance, you have metastatic disease, uh, after a time you become stable and you get kicked off of SSDI. You said, you know, you need a different attorney. But can you elaborate more? I mean, what is the argument that the attorney is going to be able to make? What do you need to hear or have written from your office? Okay. Yeah. So question is, um, <laughs> what does Social Security need to hear to continue to approve somebody as disabled whose condition has stabilized with metastatic breast cancer. So Social Security, in their mind, has one burning question. Is it possible for you to do any kind of gameful activity, money paid work, any kind, not what you were doing before, not what you're trained to do, not what will support your family, any kind? Could you go to vocational rehab and with some Americans with Disabilities Act advocacy get some kind of a job? That's what they're trying to sort out. That's their one, and, and is it because of an illness or an injury? That part's kind of easy. So that, that question is the question that they're trying to figure out. Therefore, having your oncologist document always helps because it, it shows the, how the illness and the treatment are affecting how you function. That's never bad. Blue Book is most helpful because that's their check boxes. Um, and then the attorney is the one that kind of tries to bring the information together because a lot of people end up getting prescriptions and treatment from more than one doctor. And the getting Social Security to understand a kind of a complex situation like the reason I can't work is not because my cancer is growing right now. It, but it's because I have to take this medicine that makes me nauseated, and I have to take this medicine that makes me immunosuppressed, and I have to take this medicine that has this effect. And this one comes from the oncologist, this one comes from the psychiatrist, this one comes from the neurologist, and this one comes from somebody else. And how do you help Social Security put it all together? And that's what the good attorney is hopefully going to help you do. And um, let's see, let me get in the back. So uh, related to the last question, if how does Social Security determine that it's stabilized? Is it because the oncologist has written another update that's indicated that things have changed? How, do they How does Social Security determine your medical condition entirely off of your medical records? So if you say your condition, I'm going based on someone saying to me, um, my condition is stabilized and I'm having trouble with disability. And I would assume that it's that the oncologist has documented that the cancer is stable at this point. But they go entirely off the medical records that they get. Thus, your point earlier, that's important each time you go to the oncologist to bring the blue book and... So I don't think it's important to bring the blue book every time that you come to the oncologist. Um, I think it's important to bring it any time that you are trying to send new information new important information, or you're trying to clarify something medically related to disability. But not every time you go, no, they, ooh, no. <laughs> uh, green, the lady with the green shirt in the front. Okay. I, if you, um, I forgot what I was going to ask you now. Um, Give it a minute. Anybody else got one? Because as soon as they raise their hand, you'll know. Yes, if you're me. It, yeah. I'm on the same topic that we've been on. So how often do they come back and kick you off disability? I was a little, I'm a little surprised to hear that. I'm not on disability, but yeah, I'm kind of you see. OK. Yeah, how so often how often do, do people get a notice from Social Security that you are no longer considered disabled? I don't. I don't know statistics on that one. I know that they review you every one to two years. And um, if the medical information that they receive shows that you are improved and doesn't show them real clearly why your treatment and symptoms are going to, you know, check boxes again, that it, it doesn't really clearly show why you can't do gainful activity and it says you're improved, then they're going to want to be able to figure out, they're, they're going to say, oh, well, it looks like you can go back to work. So if you were, say, making 200000 a year, but now you can go work at McDonald's, that's 
So do they care uh, yeah. what kind of job you get? So, no. They don't care. They, they no. Mm -mm. In, any employment. Now the lady in the greens remembered. Okay, real quick. Um, if you're diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer, which from the time I was first diagnosed, even now when I go into my oncologist, I am metastatic breast cancer. Even though I'm in remission for, you know, it's not growing right now or anything. So doesn't the Social Security consider that you still have that disease? Okay, so the question is, how can they say that you can go back to work if you still have the disease? Mm -hmm. So Social Security um, doesn't make most of their disability determinations based solely on a diagnosis. There are a few. That's the compassionate allowance list. Those are the ones that we don't need to know more than the, disease, the illness or injury that you have. That's enough. Outside of that list, they're looking for what proves that for a medical reason you can't work. So it's not just the diagnosis. It has to be more. If I go get a job, I have to say I have metastatic breast cancer, I have congestive heart failure, I'm this. I'm so, so the question is, it would be very hard for me to get a job. Doesn't Social Security know that? Um, and. Uh, and someone has guessed that they don't take that into consideration. No. Um, it's, it's would you be able to? They would suggest that you go to vocational rehabilitation and work with them and let them f help you figure out what you have to put on applications and what you don't and, and what kind of work you can do. But they, they're not in charge of how you get your job. We are coming probably to the end of our time. Are we? Oh, I'm told we have six more minutes. I've got a question in the back. Hand up. Go for it. All right. So if I'm going to, if I'm looking for. And if people can give me some, a little bit of quiet, because I'm having a little hard time hearing in the back. Looking for an individual health plan now. Uh, is there something specific? in that plan that I need to look for knowing that I have metastatic. So if I want to buy an individual plan like through the ACA, is there something specific I need to look for in that plan? If you buy an Affordable Care Act plan, there's no such thing as a pre-existing condition, so don't worry about that. But if you're looking outside of the healthcare.gov marketplace or your state's healthcare.gov marketplace, however, depending on the state you're in, yeah, you need to be sure there's no such thing as pre-existing condition, obviously. Um, I would ask your oncologist what kinds of treatments you, you know what you need now. Ask what you're likely to need over the next year or what you might need, including medications um, and other kinds of treatments um, like infusion, chemotherapy drugs or infusion treatments. Would you need IV antibiotics? Would you need radiation? Would you need... Maybe, and these are all maybes. And what you can say to him is, I don't need to know exactly what you're going to give me for the next year because you can't know that, and I can't either. But you can tell me with what's within the range of possibility, and then include those in. How is that covered on the plan? I think most particularly about the drugs. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and uh, there was some advice to ensure that you get a good pharmacy benefit that you ask a lot about the prescription drug coverage because you're going to use a lot of prescription drugs <laughs> and um, you might ask about um, the what is the coverage for experimental treatments or clinical trials are they covered are they not covered are there things that I should know about that doctor says the test is medically necessary or the drug is medically necessary, Medicare can still deny it. So what if your doctor says that the test or, test or drug is medically necessary, can Medicare deny it? There are two things that come into play. 
One is a prior authorization. That's where they will pay for it, but you have to meet the criteria. And if they deny that, then it's just a matter of giving them the right information so they can approve it. If it is a non-covered drug or service, they will not pay it. It's, it you can't, there's nothing to appeal. Um, and that's the key question that I would ask the pharmacist. Is it just non-covered or do we need a prior authorization or why is Medicare saying they won't pay for this? Because they will say why they're not paying for it. And you can appeal what's, what's covered but you didn't look like you met the criteria. You can always show more information to show that you do. But if it, Medicare hasn't got it written in, um, then they don't. And it, that's kind of like as flat as that. With commercial payers, um, private insurances through individual plans or um, com employer plans, you might have a little more leeway to lean on medical necessity to make them cover it. But um, for entitlement programs, they're writ it's written into the law what they will and what they won't. The regulations get updated periodically. Good information. I think we're done. <laughs>